In this chapter, Nagel asks the question, what is the relationship of mind to those better known aspects of objective physical reality? Even if we endorse the objectivity of the mental world, we still have to give an account of how mind, subjective mental processes, fit into the same universe as described by our physical concepts. So the question is, how does a being with a mind, a point of view, and a wide range of subjective experiences and mental capacities arise out of a basic arrangement of physical materials? One possible answer is to say that the mind cannot arise out of purely physical materials. Something has to be added to that arrangement, namely a soul, which can then be the bearer of those mental properties. This position, of course, is known as dualism. But Nagel thinks that dualism is implausible for several reasons. First, the relationship between the mental and the physical seems to be more intimate than would be the case if dualism were true. There's a close connection between the mental and the physical, even if we can't say precisely what that connection is. And Nagel thinks that it would be surprising if they were completely detachable from each other, as dualism suggests. Second, the idea of a non-physical substance doesn't really explain how that non-physical substance can be the bearer of mental properties. How does something being non-physical explain how there could be something it was like to be that thing? Something being a non-physical substance doesn't seem to qualify it as any a better candidate for being the bearer of mental properties than a physical substance, such as the brain. In other words, it's just as mysterious how mental properties could be predicated of a non-physical substance as it is for how they could be predicated of a physical substance. The real difficulty here, according to Nagel, is how to make sense of the assignment of essentially subjective states to something that belongs to the objective order. How can we reconcile, if we can at all, the essentially first-person character of subjective mental processes with a third-person objective understanding of them. Nagel agrees with the dualist on this front, though, that mental states are not purely physical states. But the falsity of physicalism doesn't entail or require the existence of non-physical substances, or soul. That's where the dualist goes wrong, according to Nagel. All that the falsity of physicalism entails is that things can be true of conscious beings that can't be reduced to physical terms. So the body, for Nagel, possessing physical properties could be compatible with the claim that the body possesses mental properties. We'll explore this view in just a bit. Another view Nagel considers is what he calls the no-ownership view. That mental events are not properties or modifications of anything at all, but simply occur, neither in a soul nor a body. But Nagel doesn't think this view is intelligible either. He writes, something must be there in advance, with the potential of being affected with mental manifestations, if lighting a match is to produce a visual experience in a perceiver. The potential must have a pre-existing basis. Experience can't be created out of nothing any more than flames can. The nature of this medium, however, is unknown. In principle, it could be anything, a world soul, for instance. Nagel writes, no doubt the correct model has never been thought of. Because of the apparent intimacy between the mental and the physical, Nagel is led to a dual aspect theory, or what is also referred to as property dualism. This is the idea that the brain, while having physical properties, also has non-physical properties as well. Mental processes and physical processes are two aspects of one more fundamental underlying substance. We'll be digging into this view further in just a bit. Nagel, however, acknowledges some of the problems and misgivings he has about a dual aspect theory right up front. There is a mystery here about how one thing can have two sets of mutually irreducible essential properties. How can one thing have both essential mental properties on the one hand and essential physical properties on the other? If we accept the irreducible subjectivity of the mental and we reject psychophysical reduction, then it is unclear how there could possibly be a necessary connection between the mental and the physical. The physicalist accounts for this conception by claiming that mental processes are really just certain sorts of physical processes, and so are necessarily connected in this way. 
But according to Nagel, reduction isn't the only kind of connection. They might be connected insofar as each has their causal origin in some third underlying substance. The main problem here is figuring out how mental events might also have physical properties. How can concepts that refer to events with an irreducibly subjective character also have properties of the kind that characterize the brain? Now, as we've seen, Nagel thinks that despite the subjectivity of mental entities and events, they can still be located in the objective order through a concept of mental objectivity. And we now have to consider the possibility that these entities and events, quote, might also be characterized by physically objective properties of the kind the brain has. This is his task in setting out a dual aspect theory, a task which requires reconciling the subjective point of view with the objective conception that is generated from detaching from it. To begin working out this dual aspect theory, Nagel begins with the idea of the self. Because the self seems like the ultimate private subjective object, apparently lacking logical connection to anything else, mental or physical. When I think about my life, my experiences, past, future, and present, my identity through time seems to be predicated upon the identity or self-sameness of the I that accompanies or is witness to the experiences that I undergo. On this view, I must be a pure, featureless mental receptacle. And this pure mental receptacle seems to be independent of both bodily continuities, but also of psychological continuities. It seems like, for instance, that although my body changes over time, I'm still this same subject of experience. Even though my psychological traits have changed almost entirely from age 3 to age 30, I still seem to be the subject of all these varying experiences. This is why the I seems to be detachable from anything else. The concept doesn't seem to depend on anything other than itself. The self-evidence of this I doesn't seem to require or rely on any relation of continuity over time. And it tempts us to think of this I as a kind of non-physical soul, capable of existing independently of both body and mind. But there are serious problems with this idea that the soul is the seat of the self. Because a soul doesn't seem to be able to bear the weight of personal identity, according to Nagel. Locke, for instance, noticed that the self cannot be defined as a kind of object, either physical or non-physical, as a body or as a soul, and instead postulated that the self could be identified as sameness of subjective consciousness. Because if the soul were what gave identity to the self, then it must be that the soul connects the various moments of subjective experience together. But if that's the case, then what really constitutes the self is the sameness or the continuity of that subjective experience, chains of memory linking one experience to another, and the soul drops out as an irrelevant addendum. But the idea that the self is constituted by the sameness of subjective consciousness, held together through the function of memory, is not itself immune from serious criticism. Because it seems like sameness of consciousness isn't entirely captured by the continuity of our psychological states. It seems reasonable to, at least in some instances, identify a subject as that very same subject, even though a break or discontinuity in their psychological states has occurred. See, for example, the paper by Bernard Williams, The Self in the Future. But Nagel thinks that questions about identity have definite answers. So this can all seem pretty complicated and confusing, and maybe one would be tempted to just say that there isn't any answer to the question, what is the self? But Nagel doesn't agree with this and thinks that questions about identity require definite answers. And this answer must be answered not on the basis of convention, such as when we speak of the same nation, or the same restaurant, where lines or boundaries of identity are drawn on the basis of convention alone. Nagel writes, This seems to leave us with the conclusion that being mine is an irreducible, unanalyzable characteristic of all my mental states, and that it has no essential connection with anything in the objective order 
or any connection among those states over time. Nagel concludes that there must be something wrong with this picture, and he thinks that the mistake lies in Descartes' conception of the self. The apparent impossibility of identifying the self as anything or even essentially connecting it with anything comes from the Cartesian conviction that the nature of the self is fully revealed in introspection, that our immediate conception of it in our own case contains everything essential to it, quote, if only we could extract it. But we never seem to be able to dig deeper into the idea of the self than giving it the label of the self. It doesn't yield up anything further through investigation. The concept leaves no room for the discovery of further essential features, which would figure in a richer account of what I really am. And the idea that I could identify myself with an objectively existing thing seems to be excluded from this conception of the self that I obtained through introspection. The first step here is to deny that the concept of myself is purely subjective as the Cartesian assumption makes it out to be. So in what sense is the concept of myself objective? If we return to the insights of Wittgenstein for a moment and recall that mental concepts, such as that of a mental state or feeling state, have both public and private criterion of applicability, that is third person and first person conditions of application, then in order for me to correctly apply the concept of a mental state, I need to know when it is applicable both in my case and in the case of others as well. There needs to be a rule that I can follow, even if I do so only implicitly. This lends mental concepts that refer to essentially subjective states or entities a kind of publicity and objectivity. It gives us a notion of mental objectivity, and this idea of mental objectivity enables us to think objectively about essentially a subjective processes. And for Nagel, this is also the case with personal identity. The concept of the self is an objective idea that refers to an irreducibly subjective phenomenon. Nagel notes that in the case of mental objectivity, we didn't start from our own subjective mental states and then generalize out from there to the existence of the general class, but rather started from the fact that other minds exist and from there saw our own states as one type of instance of something more general. Likewise, we can understand the objectivity of our idea of the self if we start with the fact that persons exist, and then from there see ourselves as one type or instance of the more general class. So the concept of a person is objective. Possessing the concept of a person means being able to apply it in one's own case and in the case of others as well. However, we cannot immediately identify the nature of what is referred to from the conditions of our own possession of the concept of ourselves, just as we can't immediately identify the nature of what is referred to from the conditions of our possession of the concept of a mental state, such as pain. We have to also know what it would mean to apply the concept correctly or incorrectly in the case of others as well. So how can a property like being mine, which seems to refer to an irreducible subjective property of my experience, also refer to something in the objective order? What objectively are these persons we refer to? The idea is that there must be a notion of objectivity that applies to the self, because there is the possibility here that we can make a mistake. For instance, Nagel gives the example of someone remembering falsely making a witty remark that someone else actually made in their presence. Or for instance, I might think I am someone that I'm not. This shows that I can make a mistake in my application of the concept of myself, and therefore that there is some publicly available criterion of its application. But what is this? Nagel writes, There is a distinction between appearance and reality in this domain as elsewhere. Only the objectivity underlying this distinction must be understood as objective with regard to something subjective, mental rather than physical objectivity. In the domain of physical objectivity, we can see the appearance-reality distinction come in when we mistake, for instance, a large object far away for a small object. Our perception here, the appearance, has diverged from the objective physical object reality. But let's move over to the domain of mental objectivity. 
In the case of a sensation like feeling pain, the appearance reality distinction also enters in, but the reality here is itself a form of appearance. In other words, when I feel pain, it doesn't seem like that feeling of pain is something I could be wrong about. But if our idea of mental objectivity holds, then the appearance reality distinction must be applicable here too. So when I feel a pain, that pain appears to me in a certain way. There's something that it's like to feel the pain, its subjective character or quality. But what is the reality underlying this appearance of the pain? It's simply the pain itself, which is an appearance. So here we have a distinction between an apparent appearance and a real appearance. This distinction between an apparent appearance and a real appearance cannot be explained in the way we explain the perception or sensation of an ordinary object. In the domain of physical objectivity, there's a way of checking whether the appearance has diverged from the reality. The process of checking is available when we disengage from our first person point of view and view things from the third person point of view. But in the case of the domain of mental objectivity, no such distancing from the first person point of view, which would independently enable us to verify the conditions of the application of the concept is available. And this makes it seem like there are no independent markers that would enable us to anchor the distinction between the apparent appearance and the real appearance. It makes it seem like the conditions of objectivity in the domain of the mental will forever remain hidden from us. That what is referred to by our mental concepts is something that is perfectly simple, self-evident, and private. However, if the sensation of a pain were the perception of an essentially private object, that is an object only accessible via direct introspection, the sensation would not be the thing itself but only the way in which that private object is appearing to us. Even if the private object were to change, the sensation would be the same if it appeared the same. In this way, the private object is shown to be detachable from everything else and therefore loses its relevance. It can play no role in distinguishing between appearance and reality. Therefore, there could be no concept of a necessarily private object of experience detachable to any one person, since no distinction between the correct or incorrect application of the concept would exist. But such a distinction between appearance and reality does exist. Nagel writes, all conception, including concepts of how things appear to us, must admit this distinction. For Wittgenstein, psychological concepts meet the condition of being governed by objective rules in virtue of the connection between first-person and third-person ascriptions. That is the sort of objectivity appropriate to what is essentially subjective. The objectivity of mental concepts is not obtained by reference to logically private objects, but first- and third-person conditions of applicability that ground the correct or incorrect use of such concepts. Nagel thinks this conception of publicity can now be applied to personal identity. It follows then that when we are referring to appearances, we're not referring to logically private objects, but rather we are applying concepts to appearances that have public, third personal criteria of applicability. However, the conditions that govern the objective application of concepts to sensations and mental states don't govern objective ascriptions of personal identity because the property of being mine is not a phenomenological property like being in pain. We can correctly identify states of pain because each pain state is relatively similar enough to others such that the occurrence of the state immediately enables us to recognize it as such. However, qualitative similarity is not the same thing as identity. The qualitative character of our mental states tells us nothing about the identity of the self, as we saw in the Critique of Locke's view, for instance. Identity is a concept that is tricky and more difficult to, well, identify. However, when I ask myself whether a future experience will be mine or not, it seems like there could be a right or wrong answer to a question like that. If there weren't, the question would be meaningless. If there are definite answers to questions about identity, 
then there must be an objective criterion that governs correct or incorrect ascriptions of personhood. There are two types of objectivity pertaining to identity that Nagel brings our attention to here. First, identity of the self can be explained in terms of other psychological concepts, making the objectivity of the identity of the self parasitic on the objectivity of those psychological concepts. For example, we might think that the continuity of a subject's mental states through time, linked together through chains of memory, can account for the objective identity or presence of a self. But we already saw that on such a view, the self drops out of the explanation as irrelevant. The second option here is to treat personal identity as an independent psychological concept. The self underlies psychological continuities, but has no necessary or sufficient conditions specifiable in terms of them. Nagel endorses the second option here. And the question is how we can have an objective conception of identity that underlies other types of continuity in the way we do for other psychological concepts, like feeling pain. In other words, how can we have a concept of identity that expresses, on the one hand, its subjectivity, but at the same time admits of correct or incorrect usage? To begin, it appears that while the concept of an identical self cannot be defined in terms of psychological continuity, it still is closely connected to psychological continuity, such that psychological continuities can be evidence of the self. The psychological continuity of my mental states enables me to identify myself, and the continuity of other people's mental states allows me to identify them. What's interesting here is that reality can diverge from the evidence, because it is logically conceivable that a person at one stage and a person at a later stage are psychologically continuous with each other, but not the same person. See Parfit's examples in his paper, Personal Identity, linked in the description below. Nagel thinks, conceptually, this shows that the self is something in its own right, beyond observational, whether physical or mental, continuities. What Nagel is looking for are criteria of identity, not evidence for it. Nagel writes, the question is whether the reach of the concept beyond the introspective and observational evidence and the correlation between them permits us to interpret it as referring to something with still further features, something with a nature of its own. Something that we may not be aware of merely by introspecting on our own mental states. The concept of the self may refer to something whose essence the concept itself might not be able to capture. Nagel writes, our idea of ourselves is one whose exact extension is determined in part by things we don't necessarily know simply in virtue of or as a condition of having the concept. Our true nature and the principle of our identity may be partially hidden from us. So having the concept of the self doesn't reveal to us everything about its essential nature, as Descartes had supposed. Instead, there may be features of the self that cannot be identified in virtue of having the concept. And this, it turns out, is the case with other sorts of concepts as well, as we'll see in just a moment. Definite descriptions, proper names, natural kind terms can leave open the possibility of only a partial specification of the nature of that to which they refer. The concept water, for instance, was only later filled in by the concept H2O. It took time to discover the essential nature of water, but the concept water was still applicable and useful in the absence of knowing its essential nature. When a term refers to something whose nature is not captured by the conditions of applicability themselves, those conditions can still provide a basis for further investigation into the reference true nature. For example, at one time gold referred only to objects with certain types of observable properties, such as its being highly reflective of heat and light, its malleability, its beauty. These types of observational properties allow us to identify gold, but don't capture its essential nature. Those observable properties do, however, provide the basis for a further investigation into its true nature. 
So might the concept of a subject of experience be somewhat like this? The difference between the concept gold or water and the concept of a subject of experience is that the concept of a subject of experience refers to something essentially subjective and it is the subjective mental properties that the concept refers to that must be explained if we want to find some kind of objective referent for them. So what we are looking for is objective completion of the self, something, quote, which straddles the subjective objective gap. Nagel thinks that the concept of a subject of experience contains the possibility that it refers to something with objective essential features beyond the features included in the psychological concept itself. That is, it refers to something beyond what is accessible via introspection or observational continuities. And this objectively describable referent, whatever it is, needs to be the basis for the subjective features that underpin the self, such that if that referent weren't present, neither would be those subjective features. This is where dual aspect theory comes back in. The concept of the self applies to something that is essentially subjective, non-observationally identifiable in the first person and observationally identifiable in the third, which is, quote, the persisting locus of mental states and activities and the vehicle for carrying forward familiar psychological continuities when they occur. The objective referent of this concept could be any number of things, the soul, the brain, or maybe even nothing at all. But Nagel thinks that if dual aspect theory is correct, then the true referent of this thing is the intact brain. This is an empirical hypothesis about what the true nature of the self is. Nagel writes, I could lose everything but my functioning brain and still be me. And further, I am whatever persisting individual in the objective order underlies the subjective continuities of that mental life that I call mine. If the brain is in fact the bearer of these mental states and the cause of the continuity of these mental states, then the brain is the core of the self, the essential part of the self. Whereas I could survive the loss of a limb, I wouldn't be able to survive the loss of my brain. Nagel writes, the intact brain seems to be responsible for the maintenance of memory and other psychological continuities and for the unity of consciousness. Now, if mental states are states of the brain and mental states are irreducibly subjective entities, not reducible to physical states, then it follows that the brain is not just or entirely a physical system. It's also a mental system. This makes the brain a good candidate for being the self, since the brain on this conception can support both the essential subjective features or properties of the self, namely the property of being mine, and also the other sorts of evidence that come in the form of continuities, both psychological and physical. It is an ideal candidate for the self. Now, as a person, as a self, I am able to identify and re-identify myself in my mental states and memory, experience and thought, without relying on third personal observational evidence. I can just introspect from my first person point of view and identify and re-identify myself. And being a person seems to require this capacity. But being a person need not require knowing what makes this capacity for introspective identification and re-identification possible. I might not know at all what makes the capacity possible and still have the capacity. This capacity could, for instance, depend on a soul or the activity of my brain or on something that I can't even imagine. The knowledge of what makes this capacity possible is not provided by the psychological idea of the self, by possession of the concept. The idea of the self seems to leave something open that has to be discovered. Just as what I use to fix the referent of a term need not tell me everything about the nature of that referent, so I can apply the concept I to myself without knowing the true nature to which it refers. This is what gives the illusion of the detachability of the self from everything else that we can use the concept accurately and still not be aware of its true nature makes it seem as if the concept refers to a pure mental receptacle. So I may conjecture as to what the nature of the self is, a soul or a brain, each of which is an epistemic possibility given the open-endedness, the incompleteness of the concept of the self. But there's still only one right answer as to what the self really is. 
It is still possible to imagine myself surviving the destruction of my brain, given the incompleteness of the concept of the self. And this could lead me to think that the soul hypothesis is a good candidate. But if it turns out that I am my brain, then I won't have really imagined the survival of the destruction of my brain. I will have confused epistemic possibility for metaphysical possibility. Nagel next addresses some of the problems of his view as laid out so far. If what we are depends on not only our concept of ourselves, but on the world as it really is, then there is the possibility that nothing in the world can truly satisfy the concept perfectly. The issue is that the brain may not be sufficient for providing the basis for our intuitive idea we have of ourselves. Nagel writes, if the best candidate for what I am is my brain, the best candidate may not be good enough. In that case, the proper conclusion would be that the self which we intuitively take ourselves to be does not exist at all. If the brain is the basis in the physical world for our intuitive idea of the self, and the brain can't easily satisfy the concept of the self perfectly, the conclusion may be that the self does not exist. This is Parfit's conclusion that, quote, our most natural pre-reflective concept of the self does not apply to us. Parfit refers to this idea as the simple view. Our most natural pre-reflective concept of the self is what Parfit calls the simple view. On the simple view, nothing can be me unless A, it determines a completely definite answer to the question whether any given experience, past, present, or future, is mine or not. This is what he refers to as the all or nothing condition. The idea is that our conception of the self must be able to determine an answer to any question about whether or not any experience is mine. If it can't, then it's not a satisfactory conception of the self. It doesn't meet the simple view. And B, it excludes the possibility that two experiences, both of which are mine, occur in subjects that are not identical with each other. This is what he refers to as the one-one condition. Stated a little differently, I can't be two people. If my concept of the self allows, even if just in rare instances, for the possibility that I have experiences which occur in subjects that are not identical to me, then that would show that no such conception of the self is satisfactory. Now, if my survival depends on my brain, it is at least conceivable that via commiserotomy, bisecting the corpus callosum, the brain could be duplicated. If that were the case, then it seems conceivable that I would survive as two persons, which would violate the one-one condition. And if my brain could be gradually replaced cell by cell, on the other hand, accompanied by a gradual transformation of my personality and memories, then a future experience might belong to someone to whom there was no answer to the question of whether or not they were me violating the all or nothing condition. If these types of scenarios are not merely epistemically possible, but metaphysically possible, then there are conditions that the ordinary concept of the self can't meet. Something like a simple, indivisible soul must exist to satisfy the simple view. But if the subject of our mental life is complex and divisible, namely the intact brain, then it can't be a suitable bearer for the concept of the self laid out by the simple view. If we were to take our view from Parfit, we should stop focusing on the brain and instead focus on psychological continuities, because this will enable us to see that what matters in cases of identity is not the existence of an underlying self, but of psychological and physical continuities more generally. Again, see the link to Parfit's paper in the description below. But contrary to this, Nagel thinks that whatever is the cause of these continuities is what matters here even if whatever that is doesn't satisfy the simple view. In ordinary cases, the brain does satisfy both the one-one and all-or-nothing conditions, just not in all cases. But Nagel thinks it is something without which we could not survive, and so the best candidate for the objective reference of the self is the brain. The fact that the brain is the seed of the self doesn't provide a definite answer in all cases 
makes it hard to internalize a concept of myself as identical to my brain. Nagel writes, if I am told that my brain is about to be split and that the left half will be miserable and the right half euphoric, there's no form that my subjective expectation can take because my idea of myself doesn't allow for divisibility, nor do the emotions of expectation, fear, and hope. So you might think, if we are going to abandon the simple view, why not go all the way with Parfit and abandon the idea of the self as the underlying cause of mental life? Nagel responds by saying that he doesn't really have an answer to this other than that the self should be the place where one's mental life takes place, something beneath the contents of consciousness. If there were not such a thing, then the idea of personal identity would be an illusion. But it isn't an illusion. The brain is at least a better candidate than nothing at all. And this brings us back to the mind-body problem. The conclusions drawn about personal identity can now be transferred over to the relations between brain events and mental events. The idea of a mental event is irreducibly subjective, but the possibility remains open that such a concept also refers to something physical because the concept of a mental event doesn't tell us everything about it. The concept of a mental event is incomplete, much as our concept of the self doesn't tell us everything about its nature. If our application of mental concepts leaves open the question as to their true nature, then this leaves open the possibility that something physical about it remains to be discovered. The mental concept captures the subjective criteria of application, but that doesn't mean it captures the phenomena's entire nature. In other words, mental concepts may only capture one aspect of the mind. This doesn't guarantee that the mental concept can be filled in by referencing the brain, but it does leave open this possibility. If we adopt dual aspect theory, then we can think of mental events as having both essential mental properties and essential physical properties. But what if we are not able to form a conception of a necessary link between these mental and physical properties? If we can't show some kind of necessary relation between them, the thought that the mind can be separated from the body, that a mental state doesn't necessitate a brain state, seems quite plausible. Dualism becomes appealing. To block this swing into dualism, Nagel wants to say that the possibility that the mind can exist without the body is an epistemic possibility, that is, a possibility we can coherently conceive of, but that it's not a metaphysical possibility. It seems like I can imagine my present experience occurring without a brain, but I'm not really imagining something that could in fact be the case. It seems like I can conceive of this because when I do imagine it, I'm not in a position to know whether what I'm imagining is really possible. So for example, my concept of a personal experience of pain cannot tell me definitively whether its independence of a brain state is conceivable or not. I could assume that someone in exactly the same physical brain state as me doesn't feel pain, whereas I do. But if it turned out that the physical conditions and the subjective experience are two aspects of the same thing, then I wouldn't really have imagined this. Because the physical state that is the experience of pain in me, when instantiated in another, would also result in such an experience. So a zombie that doesn't feel pain is conceivable, it's epistemically possible, but it isn't metaphysically possible. Likewise, if dual aspect theory is correct, then it's not a metaphysical possibility that a mental state can be completely independent of a brain state. I can conceive the possibility epistemically, but not metaphysically. But Nagel also admits, we have at present no concept of how a single event or thing could have both physical and phenomenological aspects. And this hedging around the plausibility of dual aspect theory occurs throughout the rest of the chapter. Nagel simply asserts that our mental concepts don't guarantee us complete knowledge of those events. There may be more to them than the concepts themselves suggest. While there is an analogy here between mental concepts and natural kind concepts, concepts such as gold, tiger, or digestion, in that the essential nature of such concepts may not be picked out 
by the concepts, conditions of applicability. There's also an important difference between natural kind concepts and psychological or mental concepts, in that natural kind concepts can be fixed by contingent features, such as how they look or feel or where they were found. Whereas the referent of the concept pain is not fixed by a contingent feature of pain, but rather by its intrinsic phenomenological character. So if the referent fixes a contingent feature of the thing, then when we explore its essential character, those features will only be related to its essence contingently. But if the original concept picks out an essential feature, as in the case of mental concepts, then further discoveries about the referent will have to be connected back to this essential feature, its phenomenological properties, in a more intimate way. Let's assume for the moment that both the mental properties and the physical properties of a mental event are essential properties of it. That's what dual aspect theory suggests. Is it really possible for something to have two distinct essential properties that are not necessarily connected to each other? Maybe we could account for that connection if they were two aspects of a single essence. For instance, a tiger is both essentially a mammal and a carnivore. But those two properties are not always linked. There isn't a necessary connection between them. Something can be a mammal and not be a carnivore. Likewise, something can be a carnivore and not be a mammal. They are linked in the case of the tiger because of the essential nature of the species because of the underlying essence that supports both those properties. Something similar would have to be true if mental processes had physical properties. The physical properties and the mental processes would need to be essential components of a more fundamental essence. The problem is that we don't know whether there even is a deeper, more fundamental level underlying both mental processes and physical processes that instantiate both of them. And even if such a deeper level existed, we might be permanently blocked from a general understanding of it. So Nagel's account of dual aspect theory is highly speculative, but it offers a possibility of reconciling the essentially subjective character of the mind with our ability to locate minds in the objective order. It's a theory that allows for an integration of the essentially subjective properties of mental states with a capacity to detach from them and view them from the outside without having to resort to psychophysical reduction. There are, however, further issues with dual aspect theory. One is that it looks like it leads to panpsychism. If the mental properties of a complex organism, such as the brain, have to result from some properties of its basic components, then those basic components must have mental or proto-mental properties. How could something that is conscious arise out of something that is non-conscious? Whatever this deeper underlying essence is, it must possess proto-mental properties. But it's hard to see exactly how this would work. Nagel writes, we cannot at present understand how a mental event could be composed of myriad smaller proto-mental events on the model of our understanding of how a muscle movement is composed of myriad physical chemical events at the molecular level. We lack the concept of a mental part-whole relation. The issue is that mental events are divisible in time, but not in space. And yet they occur in a spatially extended organism. So they must have parts that correspond to the parts of the organism in which they occur. This suggests a mental analog to spatial volume and spatial complexity. What exactly this would be, however, is unclear. The problem is that everything going on in consciousness that we are aware of at a given time seems to be present all at once which seems to indicate that mental events are simple and indivisible. Consciousness appears to be a unity. This is a problem for the idea that mental states are states of something as complex as the brain. If mental events are complex, then there will be microscopic mental processes occurring in subparts of the brain, which when combined together give us global mental processes. But consciousness doesn't seem to be like that. What we need is a theory of conscious organisms, which are combinations of chemical elements occupying space, which also have an individual perspective on the world. 
when these materials are suitably arranged, our minds and bodies come into being. Certain complex, biologically generated physical systems have rich non-physical properties, and an integrated theory of reality needs to be able to account for this. Nagel writes, I believe that if and when such a theory arrives, probably not for centuries, it will alter our conception of the universe as radically as anything has to date. We need new tools, and reflecting on the impossible here will force us to create new ones. We and other creatures have minds. We are also composed of the same materials as everything else in the universe. So discoveries made about how we have minds will reveal something fundamental about the constituents of the universe as a whole. In the next video, we'll begin rounding out our series of videos by looking briefly at Nagel's conception of the objective self, for it is this objective self that, quote, places us both inside and outside the world and offers us possibilities of transcendence which in turn create problems of integration. When we detach from our particular point of view and represent the world from no particular point of view at all, we simultaneously find ourselves inside and outside the world. This leads to the problems of philosophy we have been examining so far. However, I'll go on to argue that it results in a divided or fractured self, a division that can be healed by realizing that the outward journey to more objective worlds is not the only sort of journey there is. What is currently needed is not a journey outward, but rather a journey inward, a descent into worlds of mystery and magic. It is only in the descent into the depths of psychic life that the sources of life which sustain us can be reconnected to. The inward journey offers a real and viable alternative to the objective ascent, as well as a conception of the task of philosophy that has largely been ignored and ultimately forgotten. We have no idea what worlds await discovery in the inner depths, and insisting that these depths don't exist or don't provide a genuine and authentic route to the real will only further agitate our already fractured selves that the journey outwards has wrought. To heal that wound, one must go inward and rediscover the primal source of creative life within.